HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Root 11 Potato Chips. Made with a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. To learn more, visit rt11.com. This week on Meat and 3, we're looking at factors that will shape our food world in 2019. We start with trend predictions and how media covers them. A website could theoretically devote all their coverage to these viral trends and, and get all sorts of hits. That's not a way to build sustainable readerships, just as it's not a way to build you know, sustainable restaurants. We report on a big change coming and how street meat will be served. On January 1st, a ban on plastic foam went into effect in New York City. And we round out the episode with a story about using gene editing to create the spicy tomato of the future. At first, it sounds like a, like a gimmick or like something that you would do for fun. The truth is, there is a real value behind it. It's not too late to make your resolution. Subscribe to Meet and 3 wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode this year. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey guys, it's Tuesday, February 5th, 2019. We've got a special show today here on Beer Sessions Radio. I'm Jimmy Carboni, your host. So, uh, New York City is a special place. There's a lot of politics, there's a lot of beer, and I feel like they go together. Um, we've got some guests in the house. Let's have everyone introduce themselves a little bit. Chris, you know, you're one of my favorite uh, beer writers. you one of the f- guys who first started writing about the craft beer scene in New York about 12 years ago. Yeah. I, know, I can't believe are, it's been man. 12 years and, and probably 12 appearances on this show. So Chris, Chris O'Leary, <laughs> Brew York, New York. He's been to, what, 1,400 breweries in, in the country? I, uh, 1,200 in the country, 1,400 in the world. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've been a little busy. <laughs> and so, some other guests. So we, we, we brought in a couple of uh, small business owners. Um, and Heather? Hi, I'm Heather Rush from Pinebox Rock Shop and Precious Metal. And uh, we're actually, we've got the public advocate here, public advocate candidate, <laughs> uh, our friend Rafael Espinal. Rafael, how are you? Great to be here. Great to be here, Jimmy. Thank you. Thanks, man. And uh, another small business owner. Hey, it's Danny Oliver from Island to Island Brewery and the Tap Room 642. Okay, so this, this public advocate race, um, tell us, Rafael, why don't you give us the intro? Tell us why it's happening now. You know, it's the only it's the only race in town. There's guys that work for Bernie Sanders and and Hillary. They're they're all, all over this campaign right now. It's like a microcosm of New York. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important campaign, one that not many New Yorkers know about, and they don't because uh, it's a special election in the middle of February. And two, the position is very uh, very little known. Uh, it's it's a position that's very obscure, but it's an important position because it's actually uh, the job of the public advocate to hold the mayor accountable and be your voice in the process. Uh, you know, we, we know who our city council members are. It's a very local thing. But the public advocate, the way I like to see it, is like the city council member for the entire city. Uh, our job is to be uh, your rep, hold the mayor accountable, make sure New York City is working for you. You know, earlier on the way, and Chris O'Leary, you know, he's, he, he's been covering beer and small breweries in New York for know, 12 years. He said he, he wants you to win, 
But then he said he doesn't mind if you don't. Why, why did you say that, Chris? Oh, why, why, why you, you said that? Because because you've done so great stuff for your uh, city council district too. So Thank I'm like, you. I don't want to lose you as a, you. as a city council person. I live in Bushwick. I live two blocks out oh, of your district. Man. But um, I appreciate that. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. No, and, and people know you know. And you've, I'm I'm proud of you. You you came on the show last year and things you did like the nightlife initiative. Um, really made a difference. But w- what are people responding to in this election? It seems that people want to talk about environmental issues or... Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a little quirky, right? I think you have... To, well, I mean, first of all, you have 18 people running uh, who are going to be in the ballot. Uh, you know, we know the major issues uh, that is uh, playing all over the media right now is, you know, who's going to fix the MTA, how we're going to fix it. Uh, NYCHA, public housing is a huge issue. Uh, decades of disinvestment. Uh, where is the money going to come from? You know, what is the plan to get that done? So every time you go out to all of these community forums and these um, these uh, debates, uh, those are the top two big subjects. Uh, but, you know, I'm a little different. Uh, I have a plan to fix both. Uh, I think a very concrete plan that can work. Uh, but I'm also looking at the broader picture. You know, New York City is has become uh, very unlivable for for all New Yorkers. Uh, we know stats show that you have to make one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year in order to live comfortably yes. in our city. So, we have to uh, tackle all of these issues. You know, we can't just fix the MTA. We can't just fix NYCHA. We have to fix everything. And that's yes. that's what I'm focusing on. And I think I have a plan that has like a forward thinking vision uh, that can be able to do a lot of these things that are important. To that's me. great. We're going to get a little more intro. So, um, Heather, you know, as a small business owner, you're involved in, in a local uh, c- committee or a political club. Uh, I'm a member of the Brooklyn County Committee. Uh, which, rep, uh, in theory, is supposed to uh, elect two people from each assembly district. There should be 3,000 of us on the committee. In practice, most of these are proxy voters, so they are assigned and patronage votes and uh, are not actively filled by people who are necessarily so involved you in the So you, you own two bars. Tell mm-hmm. us the bars you own. So I own Pine Box Rock Shop. Uh, which is now in East Williamsburg. I think when we opened 10 years ago, it was in Bushwick. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I own Precious Metal, which is firmly in Bushwick. On, so uh, you're Trauma a small Street. business owner, but you're also getting involved in, in like grassroots politics. Well, so, you know, with Pine Box, we did a lot of uh, uh, local, you know, community engagement events and some events actually uh, for the second uh, Obama campaign. Um, you know, just because I'm passionate about politics and uh, I'm passionate about progressive politics. Uh, and I felt really uh, inspired after the Trump election, which I think a lot of women did, to do something a little more tangible than just, you know, throwing parties for candidates or, you know, throwing like, you know, debate parties or that sort of thing. So I wanted to do something where I could have like a direct impact. The county committee is a very small uh, way to do that. But I definitely encourage all people I'd all over Brooklyn to get involved in them. Your seat is empty. I guarantee it. I'd say Sign high up and five do it. to that, right? Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, Cheers. she had, her, she had to run and get on the ballot in order to get the Yeah, I had to walk on, knock on doors and meet deal. my neighbors. It was it was a great experience. Wow. A big deal. And Danny, what about you? So you're you're a small business owner, a, a, a brewery and, and, yes. and, and pub in Brooklyn. Yes, so I've got the brewery and I've got... Island to um, Island. Tell us where it is because I love that neighborhood. Well, Island to Island is expanding out of New York. Uh, currently, but we do have the Tap Room 642, which is in Flatbush, now uh, aka Prospect Lefferts Gardens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, Another neighborhood has changed names. And I can names, tell yeah. you that, like, getting into business in New York, I have had to be um, active in government more than I ever anticipated. And had I known, I would have studied poli sci <laughs> in college. <laughs> um, but every day has been a battle since I opened up five years ago. And everything requires me to talk to my assemblywoman, my Congress, um, my uh, city council member, my senator, state senator versus my federal senator. It's no, I know. Well, yeah, that's that's puts a ball in Raphael's court. I've learned all of this only ten years ago. Uh, I was I was never really politically active until uh, I actually accidentally started working at a city councilman's office just because I was looking for a job. And that's where I actually learned the importance of local government and see how how these uh, how how local government actually impacts our daily lives on a day to day basis. Um, but you know, I, well, first of all, I want to say I, I'm, I'm honored to be around uh, some legends in, in the neighborhood and, and some great people. Um, but you know, I, I think it's important that we all start getting involved you know the issues you care about the most uh, I mean we care about all issues but the issues that impact you the most are happening day to day right here in our own city and the people that impact your lives you can have a vote you, you vote for those, for these people you might not be able to control what's happening in Washington but you can control what's happening within your own neighborhood yeah, it's true um, one, one other thing just want to bring Chris in Chris you know uh, Raphael last year when you were on you mentioned that you know in the area of nightlife 
some folks considered that that breweries should be considered nightlife. And Chris, what are, you were going to talk about what, breweries as economic development? Yeah, you know, I think one thing that that I've learned from a political standpoint, covering beer for. 12 years in New York is, is watching the evolution of beer here. Um, obviously a lot of, of what's happened has happened at a state level, um, in terms of easing the process of obtaining a license, um, and, uh, and supporting other, you know, industries like agriculture alongside it. But, um, but one thing that we obviously, um, value in, in New York City is is community spaces and breweries kind of act as community spaces mm-hmm. here. Um, so while yes, nightlife is obviously important at night during the day, there are lots of breweries where you know people bring their families yes. and, and kind of gather, and it, it's a, it's a it can be another community gathering space. It's really necessary in a city like New York where we're kind of you know we're kind of cramped together. We don't have much space. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, of course, it's just because, you know, I, I, I did create the Office of Nightlife, and, and the goal is how do we uh, continue keeping these, you know, vital spaces open? And I say vital because these are spaces where you build community. You know, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the old archaic way to look at it is to say, oh, this is just where people go drinking. But this is where people go meet friends. This is where uh, you might meet your next spouse. Uh, you know, this is where you network for work. And this is a place where you might just want to burn some steam after a hard days of work. Uh, and, I, and that's very important to, to foster and, and protect, uh, especially in a city like New York, where we all know there's a lot of social and economic and environmental pressures that are affecting us on a daily basis. I think it's important to note that breweries are not just uh, community spaces, and they're quite far from nightlife spaces. They are manufacturing facilities. Yes. These are job mm-hmm. creation yep. engines. And when we get thrown into the wrong categories, one, it puts a stigma on what we create and then also it makes people afraid to approach it because they think that it's just a place where there's alcohol and booze Mm -hmm. and debauchery and that's not what we create when we create our breweries we create education spaces Mm -hmm. we create community spaces and we create job engines because the skills that we teach and that we go through in breweries are skills that can take people to the end of life and bring their children into it, and it can become generational jobs that we are recreating from the ground up in this new generation. Yeah. And that's and th- that's interesting that you mentioned that, too, in terms of um, economic development, because, um, you know, it actually goes back to you know, all politics being local. It comes down to zoning, even. You know, there are zoning categories that larger, that basically manufacturing breweries versus brew pubs are... Uh, put into in New York City and, and you know it's why we end up with breweries and you know industrial buildings and you know surrounded by you know chop shops and <laughs> and car repair shops except mine except <laughs> yours yeah no exactly <laughs> well Flatbush let's just jump to another thing so you know small business it's like you're right Danny that we we get hassled um, sometimes I feel that the last thing I want is the city council to pass any new law affecting a business. What I love what you did was there was the signage issue right. in Brooklyn. Tell us what you did. It seemed like the common sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was common sense. We had uh, thousands of businesses receiving 301, uh, 301 calls and violations from the Department of Buildings uh, simply because of their awnings. And uh, these were businesses that had awnings up for decades. These are businesses that just put up an awning. But the, the issue was that uh, business owners weren't really educated on, on what are the rules, who do you have to hire, what sort of licenses you need to have these these permits up. Uh, but but there was someone calling through on one on every single business uh, across the entire borough in the city. And pretty much what happened was that every business was getting fined five to twenty thousand dollars by the Department of, of Buildings. So what we probably could have, what probably has has happened over the past few years is that some of these places might have had to close. Uh, you know, go bankrupt. Um, people lost their jobs. People lost their livelihood. Um, and the city really was didn't really wasn't sympathetic about it. I mean, they they, they were like, oh, we had a response to want to call. It's our job just to respond. It's like that's just that's just pure bureaucracy. At what point does the city agency takes takes a step back and says, well, something is going on here. Uh, we have to alert the mayor. We have to alert the city council that we need to fix this. So it really took uh, the the business community to organize, uh, uh, bring the situation to me, and for us to be able to continue pushing my colleagues to support a bill that got all these businesses a full refund. Uh, and also a two-year extension for them to be able to do the proper work in order to get the signage up according to the law. Uh, but I, I want to add also uh, to the the jobs component of, of just nightlife in general and, and the breweries coupled together. You know, a report was just released. Uh, 
you know, these establishments uh, create over 300,000 jobs across our city. Uh, it's a, over $10 billion economic engine for our city. And I think that New Yorkers need to understand that, especially those that are probably a little less sympathetic uh, to m the little quality of life complaints that could easily be, uh, you know, resolved if, if only uh, we have real com communication between each other. Yeah, and one more thing about small business. Um, you know, there's all the talk about Amazon coming to New York. And I don't really want to talk about that, but I want to talk more about small business, where I only this year was I made aware that s small businesses in New York City employ more people than any other sector, more than the government, more than Amazon, more than Google. Do you want to say anything about small business in general, Rafael? Of course. New York City should be supporting its small businesses. New York City is New York City because of its, how vibrant and diverse uh, our establishments are, whether you're a bodega or you're a dry cleaner or you're a brewery or mm -hmm. a pizza restaurant. Uh, I mean, that's what contributes to New York. I think people want to live here because of that diversity and that access. Uh, once we start losing all of that, once development starts taking over or we start prioritizing places like Amazon, uh, we're going to start losing the soul and, and people will start moving out. I think that's why it's so important for small business owners, if you have the time or energy to get involved with yep. your local politics, because... Uh, so much of the focus in New York does go to projects like Amazon. I know you don't want to yep. talk about it or, you know, big big development projects. And, uh, you know, I worked in the East Village for, you know, 10, 12 years prior to coming out to Bushwick. And I walk around there and now it's empty storefront after empty mm -hmm. storefront after empty storefront. Mm -hmm. And nothing's being done about it. Those are... You know, uh, those are jobs that every time you look at an empty storefront, you're looking at 10 to 25 to 35 jobs that just don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to say one thing about breweries, which because, you know, at Pinebox, we do so many things with small breweries. It's not just that they're employing people in uh, a local capacity. They're buying from New York State. Mm -hmm. You know, the the apples for the cider, that comes from New York exactly. State. The wheat comes from New York State. The Work water is New York State water. <laughs> you know, it's it's people tend to think of that as like, oh, just the beer that comes across, you know, the table is is just a, a commodity like, you know, your anything else. But no, that's a local product that's cre that's supporting other local farms and other local places. That's great. Hey Chris, uh, what beer are we drinking? Quick, uh, we're having the, the Space Camper from uh, Boulevard. Do you know anything about it? Uh, Cheers Kansas to you, Missouri. Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a juicy IPA, and um, it, it's, it's actually, it, it's, I thought it was pretty tasty. I just had, in good. fact, I'm going to pour myself a Thanks to flash. the friends at uh, Boulevard for sending that Yeah, in. no, they're, uh, and, they're uh, great uh, folks. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a minute on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Are you enjoying this podcast? Heritage Radio Network has plenty more. I'm Damon Bolte. And I'm Souther Teague. Together we host The Speakeasy, a show where we discuss cocktails, spirits, wine, beer, tea, coffee, and all things in the liquid universe. Yeah, our guests range from bartenders and brewers, alchemists and ambassadors, roasters and regulars, hippies and home brewers, and every expert enthusiast in between. <laughs> Browse episodes of The Speakeasy wherever you listen to podcasts and on heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Route 11 Potato Chips. From the moment Route 11 dropped their first batch of chips back in the early days of 1992, they understood their destiny as a high-quality producer. Instead of succumbing to the frenzy of mass production, they took advantage of their small size and made chipping a personal art form. The payoff was immediate, an incredible potato chip. With a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. In this world of uncertainty that we live in, Route 11 potato chips believe comfort food can be just that. Know where your food comes from. To learn more, visit rt11.com. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on the Heritage Radio Network. Hey, guys, we're talking about beer and politics here in the studio at Roberta's Pizza. We're out in Bushwick. It's part of almost East New York, uh, East Williamsburg. Uh, our good buddy, City Council <laughs> member, Rafael Espinal is here. Rafael, how are you? I'm great. I'm feeling so you're, great. You're running for public advocate. It's a special election. What is a public advocate position, and why is it so important? There's like 20 people running in New York City. Yeah, there's about... Uh, 
18 people who are going to be in the ballot. Uh, it's an important position for many reasons. Uh, one, it's it's a job that's supposed to hold the mayor accountable, especially when his initiatives aren't working for New Yorkers. Uh, the public advocate also has the power to introduce legislation and get things passed. Uh, and you know, the way the easy, simplest way I like to I like to say say the position is is that it's really like a council member, your council member for the entire city. So it gives the public advocate the opportunity to go borough by borough, neighborhood to neighborhood, and really hear the issues on the ground. As a council member, um, you know, your 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 constraints to your own district. Um, so you know, you you you're mostly focused on what's happening in your own neighborhoods. But the public avenue is the, op- the opportunity to do more for the city as a whole. That's great. And I'm, we're going to open up for questions, too. So, Chris, Danny, he- uh, Heather, you guys just put up your hands and um, whoever wants to go first. No, I, so, so I would ask that, um, you know, if um, with the field so wide, it, it, it's honestly it's hard as for me as a voter to decide. Um, uh, so what, what do you think distinguishes you from from the very wide field that's out there? Uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned answering this question because he wants to keep me as his council member, and I know he might not vote for me. But um, uh, what what differentiates me from the from the rest of the field? Uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, I am the one. The, well, one, I'm the only elected official running in this race who did not sign the letter asking for Amazon to come to New York City, uh, which was a big deal. Uh, two, I am the only one running in this race who actually has city and state experience. I was a state assemblyman for two years. I'm a city council member. I have a real understanding how both how both entities of government work. Uh, and three, I, I have a, a very forward-thinking agenda, and I think that that's what's lacking from the rest of the candidates. You know, what are we doing to set up New York to make sure that New York continues to be the best city in the world in the next 10 years? You know, or how do we uh, reduce the amount of, you know, social, economic, and environmental pressures that we're seeing in our communities today? Uh, and, and that's what really what I'm focused on. You're also young, so you see things oh, from a very different perspective. I am perspective. one of the youngest, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Another question? You don't want to talk about Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually want to follow up on what you were saying rest. about preparing New York for uh, the future in a way that doesn't, uh, like, do you have a picture of that doesn't incorporate, like, large job providers like Amazon? Yeah, of course. Like, you know, like... Like, again, with the empty storefronts, right. you know, like, I would love to see more incentives. You know what I would like to see is I heard in, Am- in Amsterdam that landlords that have empty storefronts are fined yes. for their empty storefronts. Yep. And so they are encouraged to rent them out to pop-ups and artists mm-hmm. and businesses that are sort of shopping around to see if they can, like, put their toe in that brick-and-mortar water. And I would like to see that. You know, I feel like New yep. York just sort of folds its hands. Uh, you know, I love Tony Danza. He's on the <laughs> show. He always talks about this issue in the West Village. But uh, I would like to see the, the city care a little bit more about uh, all these empty stores. They're blights. Yeah, they're blights. And, uh, you know, what, what's happening is that greed has taken over uh, our city. Um, you know, we, we, we are, we're, the, you know, that, that I think that, that attitude and, 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 and that mentality has really destroyed a lot of communities. And I think we're only um, heading in, towards a downward spiral if, if we don't do something to, to kind of... Re- to push push back against that and and there's actually one uh bill that we can pass on on the state level and it's a a vacancy tax and it's, it's taxing yeah. uh these vacant storefronts so because what happens now is that the reason they stay empty is because the owners are able to claim it as a loss in their taxes at the end of the year so they pretty much save money for keeping it empty and and we have to stop that behavior and encourage uh, them to want to rent it out by 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 require by taxing them if they keep it empty and I feel like that's that's something that that I've witnessed over time as as neighborhoods have changed, and as a tying it back to beer because that's what I do as a beer drinker, um, I've really enjoyed supporting small businesses that run beer stores and beer bars, and and I've seen so many bars and and shops get priced out of neighborhoods, and then that space stays empty. You know, and and it stays empty for years sometimes. And, um, you know, obviously the, the small, you know, small business supporters, people who, you know, support the products that they're selling, you know, there's still a market for that because chains haven't swooped in as far as craft beer goes. You know, we don't have the big chains of craft beer bars coming to New York and opening and being successful here. So obviously people want an authentic experience. And it's just a matter of making those small businesses 
um, making that experience affordable for the small business owner so they can stay in that space yeah, and incentivizing them to stay there longer. I think there are three things to consider when you, you talk about uh, incentives for small businesses. Uh, one, there's the rent to consider. Yeah. Two, there's the uh, minimum wage to consider because, you know, if you go work at McDonald's, it, you're going to get paid more than if you work at a small business. That's just the way the law is set up. It's quite unfair because we can't compete for labor. Uh, and then um, three is also to consider as a brewery, as a farm brewery, the costs that, it, that I incur just to produce Right. So I've got three big costs over my head that, you know, it makes it really difficult to continue to do business. And every day, you know, you have that conversation. Is it time to close? Is it time to close? Because New York is not friendly. And that's something to really consider moving into the future that rent, the cost of 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 labor and then the cost to produce, especially by law, we're not 60 percent New York, which we're talking about a bag of grain being 50 to 60 dollars versus 23 dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm paying like homebrew prices for for grain. Yeah. It, it makes business owners wonder, should we continue to do this in New York, especially knowing that next year your rent is going up? And that once you're out of your lease, that option to renew is going to spike your rent through the roof right. in a way where you know, okay, you got two years left, time to, to, to get a plan of mm -hmm. how you're going to exit. And no, it, it, it's challenging. And, and you know, it, it's, we're really c trying to get you in a corner here, Raphael, yeah. you know, <laughs> on, on small businesses. I, I do know I have a friend with a family bakery, 48 employees, and now their, their space is becoming a development. It's not their fault, but they are moving to New Jersey for a couple of reasons. And but we, we've seen a couple of breweries in New York City when they've had the opportunity to expand, choose to expand outside of New York City simply because of a lot of those cost you know, barriers. Some of those, things, some of those things are going to happen. And oh, sure. I, I don't think that any elect official can really be responsible for anything. I think well, I, the I think mayor and the governor can be held They can be. But They're the executives, to, you know. Just to bring it back to, to brewing, I mean, there's a historical precedent, especially in Bushwick and Williamsburg. If you look at the top of these buildings, it says, you know, the blank, blank brewery. Like, it brought jobs here, mm -hmm. you know, in the, the 50s and 60s. People moved to New York to work in these jobs. They built a life here. They have families. They bought property. And now we're behaving as though this is some sort of new wave, mm. and we don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I just... I think people tie these jobs to, you know, gentrification mm -hmm. or zoning issues and acting like it's a brand new problem. The, the footprint is already here. These buildings already exist. A lot of them are empty, yes. yeah. you know, and they could be going towards uh, local businesses. And I feel like the city doesn't want to get involved with giving uh, tax breaks mm -hmm. or any kind of incentives to what they consider vice businesses. And, and this, that brew shouldn't, yeah. beer doesn't need to be packaged in with that. And right. this is why I, I, you know, I just mentioned earlier that I do blame the mayor and the governor for a lot of what's happening because they were, they were able to find $3 billion to give to Amazon to move their headquarters. <laughs> Imagine if you give $3 billion just to sustain small businesses. Just in the yeah. city. brewing industry to the <laughs> little guys. To the little guys. It's a lot of money. Oh, man. I'd probably still live here. <laughs> well, there's some deep, dark secrets in this room. But, uh, Heather, what beer did you bring us? Talk about New York beers. All right, talking about small businesses, I'd like to give a shout out to Big Alice. We've been pouring them a lot at Pine Box Rock Shop. I have this on draft right now. Uh, it's a sour. Uh, most people think of sours, not most, some people think of sours as being sort of a summer treat. This is a winter fruited sour with boysenberry and currant. Um, and it's, you know, typical sour, 4.5%, nice and light. Uh, super quaffable one. I think a lot of beers that are coming across to you now at this time of year are a lot heavier. So we're very happy to serve it. I, everything that Big Alice does, I think, is fabulous. And, and Jimmy, you know, as much as I was talking about New York City breweries that are expanding outside the city they are expanding in the city and are about to open a barrel room and a uh, barrel facility and tasting room in uh, industry city great. in uh, sunset park so it'll be their second facility in new york city that's great well um rafael a couple more things like this whole election is very interesting to me it's been fun i got to um attend a couple of, of your events and you know and heather you probably know this from being on your district council I can't believe how hard you have to work in this election. <laughs> I mean, there's a just take us through a couple of these steps. Yeah, I mean, you you decide you're going to run for office, and then you then you realize that you have to go to every single borough, including Staten Island, which we will forget about. Uh, it's you know there are nine million people in this city, uh, four million vote are uh, registered to vote, uh, but only about eight hundred thousand to a million 
or as we saw in the past election, uh, actually actually come out to vote. And that, that's extremely high. That's record numbers, right? A million voters. So then you have to figure out who they are, and you have to figure out what you know what's what's your message and how are you going to get it to them. Then you have to raise a lot of money because each stamp to mail someone costs forty five cents, and to send them forty a million pieces of mail costs a lot of money. So you have to raise the money to get your message out, and then you have to get a team and get volunteers to come help you out. So it's a real operation. It's like running a small business. Mm -hmm. And then you have this uh, you have the campaign finance board, of course, very important, making sure the money is clean and making sure that everything's right and transparent. Uh, but you know they treat you like a small business, and you know how the city is. <laughs> you know they look at everything, <laughs> making sure everything's correct. Is yeah, this right? Is this wrong? Uh, so you're dealing with a lot of pressures and then you as a candidate uh you know every day you stay home is a day for someone else to go out and knock on more doors so you have to be out 24 7 making sure you're getting your name out so it's not and you're, you're still working as a city councilman as well yes and i'm a city councilman so i do have a day job and but uh, you know i'm proud i'm still passing legislation i'm still getting things done uh actually next week we're going to pass my bill that's going to allow for the city to start legalizing basements uh, in New York, basement apartments are illegal. Uh, so like we're gonna, a year we're too gonna, late. We're gonna, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna do it in start in East New York. Uh, hopefully this year, uh, sometime by summer this year. And if it works well in East New York, we're gonna expand it citywide. Uh, so we're working. I'm working. I'm making things happen. Well, that's what I want to say. It seems like you you've had a lot of common sense, you know, solutions. Like from creating the nightlife office, you you saw a need. Mm -hmm. You know, people do want do live in basements. You're legalizing basement mm -hmm. apartments. You know, wh what's your general philosophy? I mean, I think that uh, it's been just, it's for too long. Government has not been working on the issues that matter and that issues that actually can drive the direction of our city. And I think that it's easy for someone in office uh, to do the safe thing because they want to stay in office. They want to make sure they get reelected. They want to make sure they can run for mayor because they haven't done anything risky. You know, repealing the cabaret law is probably seen as one of the riskiest things the city council has done because of how many community boards uh, are against, you know, allowing for for the dereg uh, how they're against the deregulation of any laws that makes it harder for them to crack down on, on, on nightlife establishments. So... It's just a matter of having the political will. You know, again, as I mentioned, I just got into politics 10 years ago. I had no idea what it was. This wasn't my first choice. It happened because I was passionate. I became passionate about it. Uh, and now that I'm in it, I'm like, let me just, you know, shake things up and do what I think is right for the city and, and answer and be able to address those things that never been addressed before. Well, that cabaret law was crazy. I remember 2001, a guy ran for city council in Manhattan and he won. And he was billed as the 40 under 40 for New York Magazine because... He was going to change the cabaret laws. He never heard about it. And that's what happens a lot. People, I mean, this is something I'm getting frustrated about, and I'm, I'm going to we're going to put you on the spot. We're not done with you yet, Rafael. Okay. That you know, we have a lot of things to ask. You. I just think that the if if the city has regulations that are so onerous that people can't comply, what they're going to do, they're going to do it anyway. People are going right. to dance. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, like I worked in New York when the uh, uh, when the cabaret law was in effect, and people wouldn't, you know, they they didn't. Uh, yeah. They still dance, they're still you know. Dancing. Yeah. Uh, and what happens is that you end up pushing dancing into like unregulated, unsafe spaces mm -hmm. uh, because of how hard it is to get a license. And you know, unfortunately, you have situations like Ghost Ship that happened in Oakland where you had like this uh, DIY space. Uh, you know, same thing could have happened here in New York, and that's happening because these own, these rules and regulations and these permits and these things are so onerous that it makes it impossible for you to be able to open up a venue and do something. I'm super curious about the the basement apartment rule because I know so many people here uh, that live in sort of <laughs> off the market apartments. What what made it illegal and what uh, what is the city doing to make it regulated? So th there are there are laws that dictate what makes a habitable apartment. Right, for example, you need eight foot ceilings. You need a certain size window to allow certain uh, uh, light and air, and it's all in a way to protect uh, tenants from being uh, exploited by landlords, right? Uh, but you know the reality is that we have lofts and we have basement apartments, and they exist. Uh, and instead of cracking down on them, we should find a way to manage it. Uh, so, uh, so the new law, what it will do is uh, create regulations on you know what are the new rules in order to make a basement apartment habitable. Uh, you, you're going to need some sprinklers. You're going to need to have make sure there's two uh, two exits. Uh, make sure that the windows are a certain size. And for the first time ever, it will allow uh, for homeowners uh, to start making these repairs before that wasn't that wasn't available to them. So yeah, that's great. And you and you are aware of small business owners. You mentioned homeowners a lot. Yeah. Um, w the community you're, you've served, East New York. You know, w what are a couple other accomplishments that you'd like to let us? 
you know, know about so we could have a preview of what we might expect citywide. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I'm very proud of, uh, of this huge investment we, we brought into the neighborhood um, about 2016. It was a East New York neighborhood plan. And it was a plan that was going to, one, build affordable housing. That was the main goal of the mayor. But I, I saw it as an opportunity to address all of the socioeconomic issues the neighborhood is facing, right? Uh, East New York, had, for my entire life, has been an unlivable neighborhood uh, because of the lack of investments. Some of the, some of the most invested schools, some of the worst infrastructure, uh, you know, little access to, to good-paying jobs. Homeowners were underwater on their mortgage. Uh, tenants were dealing in unhabitable apartments. So what the neighborhood plan was actually uh, help, allow me to do is get over, over a quarter of a billion dollars focused just on East New York. Uh, one, to help homeowners uh, to be able to rent out the basements, to help tenants uh, be able to find uh, find an affordable apartment and be able to fight back any sort of push, any uh, any sort of um, harassment from, from landlords. And then it, it brought real investments to the schools and to the parks and, and to creating uh, local jobs. We have a great industrial area there uh, that has not really been tapped into. Uh, we have some of the, maybe I should say something here, but we have some of those affordable <laughs> <laughs> spaces for any business that's looking to expand. And for breweries. In East that's New York. Yeah, yeah, for breweries. Um, there were breweries in it. So New it's York. actually some of the, the cheapest, some of the cheapest manufacturing uh, spaces are, are right now in the East New York area. So, this plan, I think, is going to really create a very vibrant, inclusive, uh, and accessible community for all New Yorkers. But Chris, did you say, are there any breweries in no, East New York? There were breweries in East New York historically, so it would be bringing it back Another to the neighborhood. neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And then, Danny, I'm going to, this is like one of these crazy town halls where everything's going to come at you, Raphael. Danny, I didn't know before the show, so you have moved to Texas, and you're, th you're yes. th so tell us what, Why? I moved Why'd to you Texas? move to Texas? Because you're you're the example. Of, are, you, are you in Texas now? I guess She's I the non. You're, you are the example. Livable city. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I moved to Texas because New York became inhabitable for myself and my family mm -hmm. as a small business owner, um, running three businesses essentially that people can actually have access to, and one business that is purely service. So you're talking about four formats for people to interact and for me to provide service. And I was not able to live in New York. And I moved to Texas and my fa my husband got a job in his industry being paid less than what it costs for us to technically live a good life. But we have lived better than we've ever right. lived in the last 12 years mm -hmm. on basically a half, the third to a half of what you think you need to live right. in New York comfortably. Um, so yeah, I'm a business owner. But it's just not a place where you can function. So, and Raphael, that's the election for public Very advocate. Pow powerful testimony. But there's no parties. But right. your party is called what? The Livable City Party. And that's exactly what Danny's talking yeah, about. Exactly. So, exactly. What can we do about it? I mean, I lived here my entire life, and you know, uh, you know, your story is a story that I've heard from a lot of my friends who decided to move to Pittsburgh, who who moved to Austin, Texas, uh, who moved to Costa Rica, and are just looking for a, a place where they could have a more livable lifestyle uh, because New York City isn't it anymore. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking at f figuring out how do we put policy in, in place that's going to finally push back against you know all these pressures that are making us difficult to be here as New Yorkers. Uh, I'm jealous. Uh, I love Texas as well. <laughs> um, but you know, I would love for her to be here in New York and having her businesses here and her you know and, and her breweries. That's that's what we that's what we as New Yorkers I think would should hope for in the next few years. I do have a question in terms of livability in New York. Uh, do you have a plan to address the fact that uh, adults are living, you know, four to an apartment just to afford rent? Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's it's one. Uh, the rent laws are actually coming back for renewal in, in, in the state, which means that this year your state representatives are going to vote on new rent regulations, and that, that means they have an opportunity to change the laws. They can, for example, uh, propose for uh, rent-stabilized apartments across the entire city, meaning universal rent control for every single apartment, right? Meaning if you live in a luxury apartment, I'm not, I'm not defending them, I'm saying, but your, your apartment will be rent controlled. So it's, it's, just a, it's just that idea that no longer will landlords be able to just raise, raise the rents as high as they want to a point where it's unreachable for New Yorkers. Um, two, uh, you know, there's also the vacancy uh, tax. Uh, we have a lot of vacant apartments uh, that, that are out there, sitting there, while we have homeless shelters that are bursting at the seams. Uh, how do we tax... Would you put that vacancy tax on the billionaire apartments, too? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you start you start taxing all of them, and that would incentivize them to try to lower the rent so they can rent it out. You know that I don't, I don't know any billionaires. 
<laughs> but we almost yeah. do because of the beer guys. So we're tasting. This is a special for you, Raphael. This is a new IPA made That's at cool. from Six Point, which was based in Brooklyn. Um, which what's this beer, Heather? Uh, this is the Six Point Party Hat, uh, New England IPA. And just talking about local business, this 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 batch was actually brewed in Red Hook. I know Six Point does do some out of the state uh, uh, brewing, just because you know the industry necessitates that. But this particular beer and this particular style was made in Red Hook. So the uh, other reason you're on the show, Raphael, probably the only reason is that you like beer. Yeah. So what, what do you usually drink? Um, you know, as I as I got, I'm not that old, but as I got a little older. Um, it's either an IPA or a Pilsner. Um, you know, if I want a Pilsner, I just want I just want to like relax and like have something light and refreshing. Uh, and then I'll have an IPA when I want to take my time and, and enjoy something and really savor something. Yeah, Heather and I, Heather and I were talking right before the show about how uh, more and more breweries, more and more craft breweries are making Pilsners now, yeah. and. Uh, I couldn't be happier, you know. So that's what I want to drink. Yeah. But like, as I've got as I've gotten older, I'm I'm less of a hop head and more of a right. more of a like, you know, drinking drinking my dad's beer, but Something a little more refined. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's like that Coors Light or that. Yeah, ball, yeah ball exactly. Hey, nice we don't use those words. On the show. You don't that's say Amazon. Words. You don't say Coors Light. Like, <laughs> retract, retract. They use corn syrup. <laughs> yes, the corn syrup. Yes. Oh my god. And, not, and there's a Super Bowl ad. <laughs> We'll talk about the Super Bowl ad quickly. What I what I thought was hilarious, and I love it. Budweiser has ads about wind power, you know, pure ingredients, and and you know it's it's marketing and all that. Wow. But I'm going to say a joke, it's slightly offensive. When I heard that there was, an, I saw the ad, and it was the Budweiser Clydesdales going through the fields of grain, you know, amber waves of grain blowing, and there's windmills going. I thought of something that my father would have said. There was a, a colloquial term for. You call it passing wind. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. so you know, beer guys passing wind. But. I, just, I just love the, the I'm highly amused by the fact that this was Anheuser-Busch's choice of, uh, of argument to make is, oh, is, I, oh corn yeah, syrup. Yeah. It's as, as though there's a stigma to corn, which, I, I mean, admittedly, there is a, a, a stigma to corn, but their beer is made with rice. There should be a stigma to rice too, you know. Yeah, if you talk yeah, about yeah. pure ingredients and in beer, it should be just, yeah. you know, bar, barley. You know, I, they, they they sneak in the rice there and that, barley, that, that's rice, hops, show. water, and, and we yeast, also know, you know? that, and in certain Belgian beers is candied sugar, and sometimes that can be made with a, a corn syrup powder. Well, so well, beer in America is is pretty broad, right? It, any fermentable sugar source. Is beer so long as it's not a, an extract? Extract is malt liquor, apples are cider, grapes are wine, uh, honey is mead. Everything else is beer, and that's where Island to Island thrives in the fact that we can use things other than barley to create our beers. And you guys also use like a lot of West Indian traditional like yes, fruit, we do. fermented fruit drinks. Yes, we do. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of what we do, not just West Indian, but all American. So we focus on what was brewed here in American pre-European migration. And so the the law actually allows us to do that and express it nice. without you know having to fall into some gray area. And, and Raphael, there's a lot of talent in this room. And Heather, just quick about your business, Pine Box. A couple of the, the the focus you had for a long time was it was vegan, but you've always had really good beer. Uh, how did that come? We've together? just always focused on um, doing craft beer, and then you know. Uh, you know, we we just uh, opened ten years ago. Now we've been there in that spot, and just the New York beer scene has changed so much. We we're able to focus on doing local beer, which has been great. You know, people are excited to have it. We get a lot of tourists in this neighborhood, strangely, <laughs> in Bushwick. <laughs> and uh, but I'm happy to have them, and they are really excited to try New York beer, and I'm really excited. To Whenever serve it. I have people visiting from out of town, that's one of the first places I take them. Is, is Thank Pine you. Box because because you represent the yeah. New York beer scene in terms of just supporting all these local breweries. So instead of taking people to ten different breweries, I can just take them to your bar. They can yeah. taste beer from ten different breweries. I love the hey, Pine we Box. We need to talk. And it's yeah. great, right? <laughs> and then the last one, Raphael. We're, we're gonna have to close out in a minute, guys. Raphael, you know one thing that I've noticed is funny is it seems like the last two mayors in New York City, almost twenty <laughs> years worth. We're born in Massachusetts. Yes. But I know you were what? born in New York City. Yes. You went to New York City public schools. You read authors like James Baldwin, who are from right. New York. Right. Um, what do you have to say? You're born in New York. We got to break the ice. You're running man. for office. We got to break the ice. And, and it's very possible that our next mayor is from Massachusetts as well. 
uh, my good friend Corey Johnson, uh, who's the speaker of the city council, who's from Massachusetts, uh, recently announced that he's planning on running for mayor in 2021. So, <laughs> you know, he's my friend. I, I love him, and I would love for him to win. But, you know, it gets me thinking, you know, how many Massachusetts may- mayors we're going to have? <laughs> you know, like, like, pride, man. Why, why, why do we love mas- people from Boston so much? I thought we supposed to hate them. You know? <laughs> they have an inferiority <laughs> complex, yeah. so they come here. And yeah. I'm saying that as someone from New England. There so. you go. <laughs> yeah. We got secrets in this room. Yes. <laughs> and last thing, Rafael, t- just tell us about your day today. This is a quick day in the life of the candidate. What you, wh- what'd you do this morning, work wise? What are you doing tonight? Because I know yeah. you got a full schedule. Uh, honestly, as a as a as a human being, like you you kind of forget what you're doing today because you just keep going, right? Yeah. Um, you just keep going, and like I have three other things after this to go to. So you know, I think that the the normal ideal day would be waking up at five forty five six in the morning. Going to a train stop, shaking hands, saying hello to people who don't want to say hello to you in the morning. Um, <laughs> uh, then after that, uh, you know, you kind of regroup with your team, see what's going on. I have a day job, so I stop by my office, kind of see what's going on legislatively, what's going on in the district. Uh, after that, you try to go to a, to a senior center, see some seniors who you know are going to vote, shake their hands. <laughs> uh, that's probably about lunchtime. Do some interviews like this one. Right, uh, I was just with El Diario, a big Spanish newspaper in the city, who was writing a profile on me, uh, and then you know I'm also working on my commercial, my first intro commercial for the campaign, so out there shooting that and recording that, so it's just it's just nonstop. If you have a gap in your day, you're not you're not doing something right. So it's kind of like selling beer. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there's a lot in common with everybody here. Yeah. Well, guys, this is an amazing show. Everybody, just uh, one more time, say their name and and, and who they are, and we're going to close out. Chris O'Leary, uh, Reyork.beer is the web address. Dot beer. Rafael Espinal, I'm a city councilman, and I'm also an av- uh, a candidate for public advocate. My website is rafaelespinal.nyc, Instagram RL Espinal. And turn out to vote, guys. The election's February 26th. It's during New York City Beer Week. This is Danny Oliver from Island to Island, the tap room 642. Uh, This is Heather Rush from Pine Box Rock Shop and Precious Metal. And I just want to say hello to Roger, who's listening at home. Hi, honey. I'll be home soon. (laughs) That's great, man. You guys a really special show, and thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, Good luck, Raphael. So get out and vote February 26th during New York City Beer Week. It's the public advocate election. Thanks, everybody. Our producer, Justin Kennedy, engineer Matt Patterson, Dylan Hoyer, our, our intern. I'm Jimmy Carboni, the host. Thanks for joining us on the Heritage Radio Network. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Woo! Thanks for listening to the Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to learn more about our 10-year anniversary celebration happening all year long, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com forward slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fair, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows that you like. Tell your friends. And please, Join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.